Hi, this is Pastor Farai. Thank you for listening to one of our sermons here at the Potter's House Church, Sydenham. To listen to more sermons, log on to our website at www.sydenhamcc.com. On behalf of all the saints in the Sydenham Church, we pray that this message blesses you. Psalms 27 verse 10. This is a continuation of our series on rejection. So it's literally, I was about to say, it's just CJ on this side. It's a little bit of a balance now. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. We are in a series called Rebelling Against Rejection or Rejection Rebellion. And the whole idea behind this series is rejection is a spirit that works in many people and we want to rebel against it. We're saying no to that spirit of rejection. We want to rise above it. And uh, we spoke last week about how uh, rejection uses fear and shame. If you missed it, it's now on our YouTube page. You can uh, watch it again. Uh, uh, Rejection and shame. Uh, And uh, the reality is rejection is the root of so many unhealthy, destructive emotions the way we react to things, our mindsets, our choices. And we're looking at reaction to bring, we're looking at rejection because we want to bring freedom. We're we're talking about supernatural deliverance. This is what it's going to take through the power of truth. Uh, You know, Jesus once said, the truth will set you free. There's something about learning about yourself and hearing truth that really helps us to be free. But here's a statement I want you to think about and it should shock you. Uh, When we spend most of our lives reacting to rejection, the way we interact with our bosses, our friends, our neighbors, most of our lives, it's literally us reacting to some form of rejection we've experienced in the past. And as this stuff is brought out, you'll be able to recognize things in yourself. Say, oh, you know, I do that, or I have traits of that, or I know someone that does that, and maybe this is where it's coming from. Maybe that this is where the root is. And we also spoke about how most of the rejection we, we feel comes through people. Uh, You are rejected uh, by uh, people more than you are by uh, any kind of circumstances that you may live in. And so today, uh, uh, you know, whether that rejection uh, affects a relationship with God, your relationship with other people or your mental health, uh, it it all affects uh, those uh, spectrums. But today we're looking at two parts. Part one today is how rejection makes us, how it plays out in our lives. Part one today, part two tomorrow, because it's just way too much. The main one we're speaking about today is pride, pride. When you are rejected repeatedly, when you have a deep sense of rejection in your upbringing, one of the things that it brings out of you and I is a sense of pride. Uh, uh, It's our reaction to rejection. And what we tend to do is in order to protect ourselves from rejection or from the feeling of rejection, the negative things, we tend to enthrone ourselves on a seat of pride. Or in other words, we make pride God in our lives because rejection affects the way you see everything. Um, uh, I... um, Uh, obviously wear glasses. I used to have uh, uh, these uh, uh, glasses that react to sunlight. Maybe you've seen them. They they look normal uh, in the inside of a building, but when you step out and it's sunny, they react and they they turn into shades. And uh, But I hated that uh, in in summer because sometimes I don't want the shade and you can't switch it on and off when you want to. So you get contact lenses and you get your own uh, set of shades. And when you're looking at the world through uh, 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 shades, Everything is tinted a certain color. When you're looking through sunglasses, everything you see is tinted. Now, I want you to imagine, this is the picture I'm trying to show you, that when you have rejection issues at the seat of your heart, whenever you look at life, everything is a judgment or a measure of your worth. And this is where pride begins to kick in. Rejection affects your viewpoint, how you see things. Titus 1 verse 15, to the pure... All things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. So this is, this is uh, um, uh, another way of saying this. If you are always, um, if you hate yourself, if you're always suspicious of yourself, then you're always going to hate other people and be suspicious of them. Um, uh, you know, I gave you the example of uh, if someone just walked up to you and said, here, I just want to give you 10 pounds. I just want to bless you. Most people would reject that. I said, what's the catch? 
What are you really trying to do? And why do we see it like that? Because children would accept it. Oh, thank you very much. They'll be happy. They'll hug the person. Because in their minds, they have nothing to be suspicious about. They're not looking at the world through any kind of lens. They're just innocent. They just live in their lives and they're just happy. They, they, they wear their hearts on their sleeves. They don't do what we do. And so here's what this text is saying. When you are innocent, when you are pure thinking and pure hearted, pure minded, everything you see, is exactly the same but when you are defiled when you have violated your conscience you look at other people and you distrust them because you distrust yourself rejected people view everything as a vote on their worth they assign meanings and words to themselves the reason why you said what you said is because of me isn't it the, the reason why they did what they did is because of me everything is a vote of their worth so there's five ways that rejection makes us into slaves that if you don't deal with this it can affect every area of your life number one we are driven to perform now if you're rejected at a young age by anyone one of the ways we, we, we respond to that is i'm going to show the world that I am not what they said I am. I'm going to make a, I'm going to prove to my dad, I'm going to prove to my mom, I'm going to prove to that teacher that said I was never going to be anything, that I am someone. And now you become super driven, not because you just want to achieve for the sake of achieving, but you want to prove a point to someone that said something. People can give you a message in your life that you have no value that you will not succeed in life. So the reaction of some people is to, I'm going to show you that I am valuable and that I will succeed. But when you live, when your existence is all, I want to prove something, I want to prove something, one of the problems is it's never going to be enough. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to show that teacher that I am something. You become a millionaire and a million isn't enough. Now you want 1.5. And when you get to 1.5 or you have a, I, I know some people, they, they get a, a, a degree, but that's not enough. So they get a PhD, but that's not enough. Then they get whatever the other letters are, the doctor, the DRE, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> whatever's out there. And they keep getting, why? Listen, you're all, you, we get it. You're super smart. But there's something inside of them. I'm trying to show the world something. I'm trying to prove a point. The second way we react, apart from uh, 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 overperforming, is we seek acceptance. People who are rejected want to be accepted so badly. Now, it's human nature to want to be accepted. It's human nature to want to be in community. We spoke about that last week. We want to be in community. You want to be loved. You want to be in a family. That's normal. But those who are rejected, their love for acceptance is so strong, they will search for acceptance even if that acceptance leads them to destruction. I read an article um, on an American website about why people, young people join gangs. Listen to what it says. They do it for a sense of belonging, acceptance, and loyalty. Gangs may offer a sense of identity to their members and a way to gain attention or status. Kids who have strong, kids who do not have strong ties to their families, communities, schools, or places of worship may turn to gangs for companionship as a substitute family. Think about that. You know, why are they running around with people that they obviously know this person is not good for me to have in my life? Because somewhere they have been given a message, we accept you. We, we like you here. We, we, and, and, so, and so there's, a, you know, I, I didn't put it in my notes, but what they do is they groom uh, these young people and they don't uh, immediately put them into areas of conflict or, or, you know, hold this gun or do this. They, they bring them in within a sense of community. You are part of something and they specifically target young men, especially who don't have fathers. Or they specifically target young ladies who don't have fathers or people who have been rejected. There's a spirit there. Acceptance. It, it, this, uh, this also comes out in sexual attention. There are uh, uh, young people. Actually, you know what? I, I, I'm sorry all the teenagers. I keep, I keep calling you out. But, but it's not just young people. It's everyone. Are, I'm going to talk about men and women. But let's talk about, let's talk about uh, women first. Uh, sexual attention. You know, the way you dress. Your, the way you walk, sexu the sexuality. In other words, uh, uh, you know, there's a certain, uh, you know, uh, some girls, some women dress in a certain way in order to get attention. 
They know that men are looking at them uh, and, and they enjoy it. They like it. Why? Because me, I, I'm, I, that's adding worth and value to me. There was a gap in my upbringing. I, I was rejected when I was growing up. Now that you turn around and say, oh, hey, good looking. You're trying to get my number and you're speaking to me. I may reject the advances. I may not go for it. But in, inside my heart, I, I, I love that. I, I, I like the attention. I read a book a couple of months ago called um, The Threshold of Hope. Uh, it's a book about uh, survivors of sexual abuse. A fantastic book. If you want to read it, I, 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 I strongly recommend it to everyone to read. It gives you an idea of what people go through and how to help them and minister to them. Uh, I, I got this part from the book and I'll read it out to you. Listen to what this young lady said, the testimony in the book. I learned well. I had sex with anyone I could. I knew some of the people and some of them were strangers. I hated myself, but I couldn't stop. I never felt anything good except once. Uh, and none of them loved me or wanted uh, me or my thoughts. They just wanted sex. That was, after all, what I was for. I would put myself in danger with men who would sexually abuse me. I guess I just wanted some kind of affection, even if it was awful. I was starving for someone to touch me. I would try to find some way to have him hug me. It didn't always work, but sometimes I would get hugged. Afterward, I would ignore the pain between my legs and the shame I felt because I could still feel his arm around my shoulder. How many people know that's a horrible way to live? When your entire existence is about acceptance at any cost. Just, just pay attention to me. Just say something to me. Just acknowledge me. Just, I'm, I'm here. For men, it's all about sexual conquest. Uh, always trying to, uh, to prove their manhood or their worth. If I can get as many women as I can, it proves something. I, I, I'm, I'm acceptable. They want me. It's not enough to have one woman in my life. I want to, as many as I can because that, that, that adds worth and value to me. It shows that I, I, people want me. You know, pornography is not just about, uh, 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 and this is exactly the same way that Pastor Mitchell said it, it's not just about boobs and bums. It's about acceptance. It's a craving for intimacy. The problem is, it's false. It's a false sense of intimacy. So number three, rejected people are also easily offended. Easily offended. Every word and every action is an assault on their worth. Listen, if you're easily offended, I'm the worst pastor to have because you text me today, I'll text you back next year. And, that's <laughs> and so for, for most people, it's like, hey, um, he's, he's obviously busy or he's forgot. You just kind of rationalize it. I'm, I'm trying to look, not look at certain people that I'm more, and, and but, but for some people, it's like, does he have a problem with me? Is, is there an issue? Have I done something? Why is he rejecting me? They're easily offended. When they are criticized, it's not constructive, it's now a personal attack. We all know people like that, uh, that you have to walk on eggshells around them. You have to be very careful what you say because uh, you say something, they're not reacting to you. They're responding to some pain and some hurt they experienced years ago. Angry people are often rejected people. You know, there's a pre-existing underlining anger issues for past Rejections. You know, people say things like, what did you mean by that? Are you ignoring me? You hate me because you didn't greet me during meet and greet. We said, turn around. And I was like, no one wants this. So, 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 so what's, what's happening here? People say things like this. Uh, um, there was one particular person uh, uh, that used to come to our church who left because they were offended. And the reason why they were offended is simply because of that. They, they were holding a baby. And whenever people came to greet them, they would greet the baby first. And that was offensive enough to leave the church. And I'm telling you now, I, 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 there's underlining issues there. Rejected people, number four, they accept false guilt. And we spoke about this last week, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But this is every negative event in their life, it's their fault. It's false guilt. I don't measure up. You, 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 are, you feel guilty about things that are outside of your control. You don't control the weather. You don't control redundancies. You don't control the economy. You don't control any, we don't, there's very little that we have absolute control over. And so when things don't work out, the spirit of rejection says to you, it's your fault. 
You are the reason they got divorced. You are the reason that that happened to you. You are the reason it's raining during outreach. And, and, and that is a spirit that speaks. I want to say this, especially to parents. God has no grandchildren. God has no grandchildren. What that simply means is all of our children need to find God for themselves. That means you're not responsible for their salvation. You can bring them to church. You can pray over them. You can teach them the word. You can do all of these things. But ultimately, our children need to make their own decision. But I see it when parents uh, really uh, feel very guilty about decisions their own children have made. But God has no grandchildren. The problems with these kind of lies is that they produce emotions, anger, hurt, anxiety, sadness. And we said it last week, just because you feel something doesn't mean it's true. Number uh, number five, rejected people end up becoming rebellious. Rebellious. Remember that rejection mostly comes from people. And sometimes the authority figures in our lives let us down. Okay, Uh, parents can let you down, teachers can let you down, your boss at work, your coaches, uh, even pastors can let you down. And authority figures in your life and in my life are there to help us. They're, They're supposed to be there to help us. Let's put it that way. Authority figures are supposed to guide you, to protect you, to teach you to train you, to help you, to give you wisdom, to love you, to warn you, to lead you, all of these things. And so if you you, you grew up in a home where you had an auntie, an uncle looking after you or your parents or a parent looking after you or whatever the scenario is, I've I've, I've lived with with uncles, I've lived with my grandmother and I've lived with both my parents and I've lived with one of them. I mean, you name it, the whole spectrum. And every time I was in a home, I was looking to them for me. That was my authority. Well, I went to boarding school and all of a sudden that authority was transferred to our teachers and our headmaster and I've seen some stuff in boarding school and I went to and I got a job and now my so we all have authority figures in our lives but the problem is if you had an authority figure that walked out that uh, negated their responsibilities or that uh, uh, misused their authority what can tend to happen is you end up becoming rebellious against authority. Rebellion simply means hostility against authority. That's what it means. Do you remember those colored glasses that we spoke about? When we rebel, we are looking at authority through the lens of a bad experience. So I don't like being told what to do. Why? Because I don't want to put myself in a position where I'll be hurt like I was earlier in my life. I, I, I don't want to listen to my teachers. I don't, want to say, I don't want to listen to my parents. I don't want to listen to anyone. Why? Because I don't want to be disappointed that when I do listen to them, they abuse their power. I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to experience a violation. And so most people start to review leaders with suspicion and fear. As far as they're concerned, leaders or people in authority are not safe. They can't be trusted. They will embarrass you. They will hurt you. They will abandon you. I remember when I took over the church, uh, uh, it took between two and three years of the 14 people that were there at the time to open up and actually start to speak to me about issues in their lives. I was thinking to myself, oh, wow, like, oh, this, is, this is weird. Like, I'm the pastor. You come in. Pastor, this is what I'm going through. We, we deal with things. But no one said anything to me. For, and it, it dawned on me as I'm speaking to other pastors trying to figure out, they just lost their pastor. Like, I'm the second pastor of this church. And so, as far as I'm concerned, this person uh, is, uh, has, has led me into uh, salvation. I'm now in church. They're, they're discipling me. They've got their hands on me. Then one day out of the blue, they're gone. So why am I going to then open myself up to the next person? So, I'm, you know, we're just going to check you out for a minute. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll eat your food, but we won't speak to you. Like, you know, like, we'll come to you. <laughs> Darren said, I remember those days. <laughs> Darren is one of them. But anyway. <laughs> and so, and so but, but that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's a natural protection that we have. Rejection, think about this. It brings past pain into present situations. You know, some people don't uh, 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 give their lives to Jesus, not because they don't believe. At heart, they are rebels. At heart, they're just like, I, I, uh, because I'm, I'm being asked or guided, I want nothing. I am the boss of my own life. I will make my own decisions. I'll come to Jesus when I'm ready. The problem is, even though it feels safe to rebel, 
It's also misleading. They never open up, never, they never get near. Because in their minds, if I get near you, you will hurt me. You would embarrass me or destroy my life. They also reject authority. Don't give me any advice. Don't give me any instructions. Don't correct me. And they fight against it. Some people are open rebels. Do you know, I actually prefer them uh, because you know where you stand with them. Uh, you need to do this. No, I don't want to do it. Now, come on. No, don't tell me what to do. And you have it out. They, they, I'm in your face. I don't want to do it. Some people are more polite rebels. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll pray about it. And then they do the complete opposite. <laughs> and they also attack authority. Rebels will also find flaws in those in authority. I think we all do this sometimes, right? When you want to justify a bad heart towards authority, you have to find flaws in them. Did you see what pastor was wearing the other day? What kind of, you know, this is why we don't, you know, or you, you speak about your teachers. You bring up all of their home issues and you speak about your boss. Every single person here, you've spoken about a boss that you, you worked with at one point or another. We, we do it because we want to undermine their authority. Proverbs 12, verse 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that heeds counsel is wise. He that heeds counsel is wise. I'm going to say in another way, the person that thinks he's right and doesn't see any other way is a fool, but someone who recognizes maybe the way I see things isn't right, let me ask some advice, is wise. If you're a person that says, I, I will never listen, uh, authority figures, I, I, I don't want nothing to do with them, there is wisdom in life that you're going to miss out on. 100%. I was thinking about this on my way here. They say that a brain isn't fully developed until you're how old? 25. I, saw, I, I was going to say, and I thought, do you know what? That might really sound offensive to the teenagers if I said, you know, your brain hasn't fully developed. It's still developing. So with your developing brain, if you say to yourself, I know what I'm doing, you're missing out the blessing of wisdom. I, you, you, I, I know exactly. No, but someone comes in. Why don't you think of it this way? And then when you when you are twenty five uh, to forty five, uh, we, we then make the mistake to think that now that we are older and our brain is fully developed, we can we know what we're doing. Why? Because we're older. But the problem is you haven't experienced life yet. There's still a whole heap of living to do, people to meet, places to go, traveling and, and different cultures and all these kind of things. But we, we've been stuck in our little circles. But now, oh, God, I'm, I'm 26 now. My brain is developed. I can do whatever I like. I don't need advice. But the, 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 it's also true that when you're older, it doesn't mean you can't listen to teenagers. They have insights into the world that we're living in now that we don't have. So it goes around in a full circle that we can all learn from each other. But once you are set in your ways, I know what I'm doing. No one can tell me nothing. You lose out the benefits of wisdom. I sometimes see people struggling as a pastor and I could help them, but they don't ask for help. Or if they do, they don't listen and receive it. Here's, here's, here's the thought. When you are a rebel, you are blind. You can't see. You make decisions that make sense to you, but everyone else looks at it and says, why, why did they do that? Why did they go there? And then we also said that it brings destruction. To, uh, uh, you lose out the, be the, the blessings of God. So the, 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 the Bible uh, is filled with stories about pe people who rebel and it never works out well. And look at what 1 Samuel 15 verse 23 says. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and, the st and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. This is Samuel speaking to Saul and he says these very powerful words. When you rebel, it's like the sin of witchcraft. You know, witchcraft, really, in a nutshell, what it is, is manipulation. When you manipulate someone to do something they wouldn't do otherwise, that is witchcraft. Whether it's through spells, uh, demonic forces, or through some other way of psychology, whatever, it's witchcraft. And so, when you rebel, there's a lot of manipulation involved in that because you have to win people to your side. But the problem is that when the blind lead the blind, they all fall in a ditch. And you miss out on the blessings of God, right? God is the one who designed us to live under authority. That's his design, not ours. So sometimes when we say, I'm rejecting that person, what we're really saying is, God, I'm rejecting your authority over my life. 
God does not bless rebellion. In fact, he fights against rebellion. Romans 13 verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, this isn't to say if someone who's uh, in your authority says, go and slap that person that's at the bus stop. They say, okay, well, pastor said I should listen to you. And you go happy slapping people. That's, that's, we, we obey authority as far as it lines with the word of God. So what does this mean, guys? It, it, it simply means this. You may not like your boss, but you have to lay aside your rejection issues and, and, and for the sake of the company and your wages and your job, just go along with it. You may not like your parents that you're living with, but that doesn't mean that you have the right to reject their authority. If they're asking you to do a madness that goes against your convictions, goes against the, the word of God, that's a whole other discussion. But generally speaking, you are under uh, 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 a grace when you say, you know what, as, as long as I'm under this roof, those are my parents. That's my mom. That's my dad. I will listen to you as long as what you're saying to me does not violate the word of God. This is what God wants for us. There's a protection there. There's a grace there because what we're really saying is, I trust God. I I'm going to do this because I trust God. Let's close. Rejection wants to rule over you and make your life miserable, but you must rebel against it. Remember our text, Luke 14, Luke 4 verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. God wants to heal hearts. If your heart has been broken by past rejection, God wants to set you free. He wants to give you liberty. He wants to set free those who oppress and give sight to the blind. So there's two things that we need to do as we close. Number one, in order to help uh, you navigate this and to help myself navigate this, one of the things that we need to do is we need to believe that God loves us. You have to have this inside of you. You have to recognize there are lies that you and I have believed all our lives. And it's now time for you to seek truth and live in truth. If you go to the next screen, the Bible says, uh, uh, sorry, next one. Uh, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So you have to believe that God loves you, but you have to know it. That no, uh, that word is an uh, experiential word. In other words, it's not just in here. We said this last week, it's in here. You know it. You've experienced it. Why is this important? Because if you are under authority to someone who isn't maybe the best example, but you're under that authority, it's the love of God that keeps you safe. You know what, God, I'm obeying you. And because you love me, you're going to see me through this. First Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This is what God does. He literally fights against prideful people. I want to prove to the world that I'm worth something. I'm going to surpass everyone. I'm going to be the first in my family to do this. And then they will love me. Then they'll recognize me. That's pride. I want to be accepted. I want to feel worth in myself. I want to, uh, all of this, there's a slight sliver uh, and a trace of pride running through. They say, God says, no, no, humble yourself and I will lift you up. The things that you're seeking are actually found in humility and you will lose everything uh, if, you, if you're propping yourself up with pride because God says, no, no, I resist that. That means sometimes we have to lay down our pride and ask for advice. Ask for help. Sometimes we have to work with flawed authority. Parents, husbands, bosses, ministry leaders, and pastors. So we have to experience God's love. Secondly, and we close with this, we have to forgive those who are in authority that have violated or rejected us. We have to forgive. Go to the next screen. Bear with each other. And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgiveness sets you free. I tell you now, even if the person that you, uh, you hate has passed away, you still need to forgive them. Forgiveness, uh, uh, anger is like you owe me something. You have a debt. You owe me. And I will never let that debt go because I'm vexed and I'm angry. That's what anger is. Forgiveness is... 
you are free of that debt. You don't owe me anything anymore. That do, it doesn't mean that you enter into a relationship with that person if it's toxic, but it means you can sleep at night. It means that you say, God, you take care of that, and you go about your business. It sets you free. You don't have to climb up to the top of the world or your world and scream out to the heavens, do you love me now, mommy? Do you accept me now, dad? Uh, you see, teacher, or whatever you know, that area may be in your life because you've, you've, you've let go of that debt. I'm living free now. I'm, I'm living... I'm living for the benefit of those around me and to glorify the kingdom of God. I'm not trying to prove anything to everyone because I've forgiven them all. I've let it go. Why? Because God forgave me my debt that I owe to him. We need to repent of our pride and humble ourselves. We need to accept that we're not the world's sole authority or expert on everything here. We need to repent of enthroning pride. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Humility elevates. Show me someone that operates in pride and I'll show you someone that at some point is going to fall in their life. And we need to ask God, lastly, to enable us to see things clearly and correctly. If I'm seeing my life through these rose-colored glasses and everything is a vote on my worth, I need a miracle. I need God to open my eyes so I can see how he sees things. So that's a prayer point. Say, God, I, 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 the whole forgiveness thing, that's going to be tough, but I, I can manage that. Uh, I, I know that you love me. I, I believe that. But, but what's, what I'm finding very difficult is to see things differently. That's where you need the grace of God. That's where you need prayer. God, open my eyes to see. We sing that song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. We need a miracle that you wake up one morning and all of a sudden someone criticizes you and it's the work that they're criticizing, but it's nothing to do with your character. It's nothing to do with your worth. Matthew 20, verse 32 to 34. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. That's a powerful text. Lord, I'm experiencing blindness in this area. Jesus says, what do you want me to do? This is physical blindness, but you know, this can translate to, to spiritual uh, blindness as well. Open my eyes. You can make that prayer. God, help me to see the way you see. I want to show you a video um, uh, of, uh, uh, of what it should look like. Okay, this is um, uh, a Father's Day video that went out. And, um, and uh, when I saw it, uh, you know, it was very emotive for me because, you know, my experiences growing up and you might find the same thing for you depending on your experiences. But I want to show you this video uh, as we close because it, it demonstrates something. When you have a good relationship with your heavenly father, it's, it's everything. It, it fills all the gaps. It really helps and it really blesses. And so uh, let's watch this video. Dad, what about me makes you proud? Oh, man. Um... Dad, what about me makes you proud? Dad, what about me makes you proud? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Dad, what about me makes you proud? And I have to answer that one? Yes. <laughs> Just about everything that you do. You're loving. You're funny. I could go on and on. <laughs> what makes me proud about you is you just being yourself. I had trouble with alcohol. It was actually an intervention. Even with all the other people there, you were the, the real reason that I made the decision to go into the treatment center that I did. And uh, thank you. Thank you. You're helpful. Oh. You forgot the funny part. <laughs> Your attention to uh, hygiene. <laughs> Dad, I am grateful to you for choosing to stay when I was little. Mm -hmm. um, why am I crying? 
<laughs> at the time when I'm graduating and I'm packing up and leaving, then it's really gonna hit me. And I think about a time when if you're not around, like that would be awful. <laughs> but like you're the you're the person that would always laugh. Dad, I'm grateful because we didn't know how long you were gonna be with us, so we're so happy that you're still here. Dad. I'm proud of you for knowing that the most important thing was to just give your kids so much time. I've always been impressed by you. You made it easy. Thanks. I miss having the chance to just check in with you. I miss your sketchbooks. I love you. I love you too. You got it. We don't say it enough. <laughs> mm. Hey. <laughs> I love you, Dad. <laughs> doesn't compute until they're gone. <laughs> so tell them now. It's sort of weird standing so close to you. <laughs> <laughs> Very powerful video. We're going to close with that. So what's the point of showing that video? I don't know if you saw that young boy when he was told uh, by his dad, uh, his dad said, uh, you make it easy. Do you see how his face just glowed? Your heavenly father loves you just like that. He has fully accepted you. That little kid said, I love you because you are yourself. God doesn't put any stipulations on his love. He doesn't love us because or if. That's how the world loves people. I love you because you're rich. I love you because you look nice. Or I love you if you give me this. Or I love you if you do that. That's the world's love. God's love is, I love you despite, I love you just the way you are. I love you because of what Jesus did. We are fully accepted. And so what does that do? It builds up confidence. The spirit of rejection cannot stand when we, are, when we have a revelation of God's love for us. When God speaks over you and says, uh, you know, uh, I, I love you just the way you are, your, <laughs> your good hygiene and you know, all these other things. You know, it's just a good relationship. So if you never had that growing up, like me, like many other people, you have that up there with God. You have it. Every day God will speak words of, of affirmation into you. And if you would accept that, I'm telling you now, it changes everything. God wants to deliver us. Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment. So let's pray, church. Thank you for listening to today's message. We pray that it's been helpful to you and God-honoring. If you were listening today and you've decided in your heart that you want to give your life to Jesus, you want a new start, the Bible is very clear that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just, that he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible teaches us that our sin separates us from God, but Jesus bridges that gap. If you would give your life to him, putting your hope and faith in Jesus changes everything. For more information about how to build a strong relationship with God, visit our website at www.sydenhamcc.com or contact us directly and we will be more than happy to point you in the right direction. God bless you.